<clears throat> Hello, fellow risk takers, and welcome to my worst investment ever. Stories of loss to keep you winning. In our community, we know that to win in investing, you must take risk. But to win big, you've got to reduce it. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm on a mission to help 1 million people reduce risk in their lives. And I want to thank my listeners in Arizona for joining the mission. Fellow risk takers, this is your worst podcast host, Andrew Stott from A. Stott's Academy. And I'm here with featured guest, Coach JV. Coach, are you ready to join the mission? Oh, it's an honor, man. I'm excited. Thank you so much. I'm I'm looking forward to it. And you definitely get the uh, reward award for the most unique bio. And ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce the thinking of Coach JV. What you believe in your heart, you think in your mind, will eventually become your words and your reality. If you can see it in your mind, eventually you can hold it right here in your hand. What you repeatedly do gets ingrained in your subconscious mind. And what gets ingrained in your subconscious mind becomes your unconscious activity. Coach, take a minute and tell us about the unique value you are bringing to this wonderful world. Absolutely. First of all, it's an honor to be here. And the unique value that I bring is my uh, past and my current perspective by losing a lot of money in these investments. So the unique perspective that I bring is uh, me and my CFO combined, spent 22 years in banking. I went to CBA executive banking school, became edu educated in the banking sector, moved up to vice president of bank. When I was sitting in the banking sector and I started to really learn what the Federal Reserve was, what money was in America, um, it didn't make me feel good. And so I ended up walking out of a high paid vice president job in 2017 to start this journey of entrepreneurship, being an investor. And through that process, um, through my losses, I've discovered uh, waves of energy and how energy moves through the system um, and how what we repeatedly do gets ingrained in our subconscious mind. What gets ingrained in our subconscious mind becomes our unconscious activities. And then a lot of people are unconsciously investing, unconsciously living their lives, trading time for money. And so what we teach people to do is how to move from the just overbroke system, the job system, to trading time for money, to using time to, or excuse me, using money to free up time. So that's a unique perspective we bring, a banking sector, a spiritual energy, but also really understanding our mistakes have become our greatest successes. And, and where do people mainly either follow you or find you? Oh, great question. So uh, one of our biggest things is on YouTube. So if anybody types in Coach JV, like Junior Varsity on Google, all of our stuff will come up. YouTube, TikTok, Instagram, Twitter. That's the best way to find us. Google the name Coach JV and all of our content will come up. And when somebody likes what they hear, likes what they see, what is it that you, you know, that you provide? What's your service or what, what is it? How do they engage with you? Absolutely. So we have what's called the 3T Warrior Academy. So that's one. We have a lot of free content as well. We have a 16-page mm. free guide. Uh, we have free consultation with our licensed insurance team. But most of the people engage with us through our private community, the 3T Warrior Academy, which is a community from a holistic approach from the inside out. Fitness, mindset, subconscious mind programming, goal setting, rewiring the foundation, and then learning how to do diversification within these markets. Mm. So maybe you can just give us an example of a type of person, maybe an example of a of a prior client of yours or general generally what clients are looking for, and then maybe one or two little tips or tricks that you help them to to get them you know on the right path. Yeah, absolutely. So our average age group is thirty five to seventy years old. Income is from seventy five to two hundred fifty thousand. It's that person who's in corporate America, just like I was, that's sitting there and like they're seeing what's going on within the economy. They know there's something different out there, but they just don't know what to do. Because like I said, we've been indoctrinated for such a long time within America specifically around how to be workers, right? So when you think about investing or you think about starting a business, uh, you think about getting in the stock market or crypto, it's what is the next step? And so what we help people do is take a deep breath and we help them relax and take the next step. But the key to it is we're teaching people how to rewire the foundation out of the indoctrination so they can make better decisions. That is the key. So it's that person just like me that was sitting there in corporate, was a executive banker and still didn't truly understand how money ran through the system. I was in a vertical system, going to school, got a job, had a 401k, 
keeping up with the Joneses, right? Had the big house, <laughs> the nice cars and stuff, but I could barely pay my bills. So it's that person that knows there's something more, but they just don't know the next step. And we teach them step one all the way through A to Z, all the way through uh, to diversification, to financial freedom. And, and <clears throat> I can imagine someone you're sitting in the, the position that you've just described, um, come across, you know, your teaching and what you're doing. And the, the biggest issue I suspect that they have is fear because yes. there's comfort in that vertical. There's comfort in that job. Yes. There's comfort in that yeah. 401k. You're doing the right thing. You're doing what you're supposed to do and going, you know, and, and looking and, and going into that. Not only that, but you also have, there's some rabbit holes. I remember uh, JV that when I, uh, when my father was older, I was talking to him and I was talking to him about what I was learning about um, the assassination of John F. Kennedy. Uh, mm. And, and I realized that my dad just didn't want to go there at that point. Like there just was no point. His life was almost over and he didn't want to open up a Pandora's box that it wasn't, you know, who he was told it was, because if it wasn't who he told, who he was told it was, then uh, that just causes a collapse in trust in the whole system. So I'm just curious, how do you handle people's fears or doubts or how do you guide them? Yeah, imagine well, imagine a world when I was in a banking school in 2012. I started CB Executive Banking School, and I'm there, and I asked a question. So I have severe dyslexia, so I really have to pay attention. So I, I'm, I'm that guy in school that asked all the questions, and so I was I met with a professor afterwards, and I said. I have a question. So uh, I'm watching how we scale banks from the ground up. You know, I understand Mrs. Jones walks in and puts $10,000 into our bank. We as a bank lend out, basically, if she puts in $10, we lend out nine of those dollars. I'm like, how does that work? I'm like, we lend it to the next person walking in and that $9 gets multiplied over and over and over again. And the, and the professor said, that's the way it always has been. And I said, but that doesn't mean it's right. And he actually recommended that I read a book called The Jekyll, Creature of Jekyll Island. So that's where that, that like you just said, it's, mm -hmm. I read the book and now here I am in sitting as an, becoming an executive banker. I understand what the Federal Reserve is, a group of wealthy bankers that created a bank for the banks that are supposed to uh, balance out the job markets and uh, they're responsible for the money supply. And I'm like, wait a minute, this makes no sense. Then I started to really understand how the money, so when I when I share with something what money, when I share with people, I ask them a question. I say, what is money? And most people think money is just something that you get to pay your bills, but money is just debt. That's all it is in America. It's debt mm -hmm. monetization. So what I work to teach people to do is like, okay, if money is just debt and my income is your debt, then what side of the equation should we be on? So we start there and I teach them what is money? It's just debt. And I teach and I really look at the, and I ask them, I always take it from a a complex macro microeconomic, and I say, pretend you're America, okay? Let's pretend we're America. So I'm America. And if I was 130% debt to income ratio, GDP to debt, okay? If I had to go borrow money from grandma and grandpa and they ran out of money, and now I need to go to my uncle and my brother and they ran out of money, then they finally downgrade me from AAA to AA plus. And I'm like, hey, listen, this money you're borrowing, it's actually gonna cost you more. So now I need to go borrow money from someone else to pay the interest that I owe grandma and my brother. I said, what would happen to me? And they're like, well, you'd be bankrupt. I said, yeah. I said, the difference, the only difference between you and America is they get to turn on a printing machine. You don't. You have to go on uh, whatever uh, government support you have to get. We have to file bankruptcy. I said, so now that we understand who America is and who we are within America, how can we get on the other side of that equation? So that's how we start the conversation, just to say, let's take it from America being us, and let's start there. And so then we look at their finances, like, okay, so let's look at where you're at. And people will be making $40,000 a year, and they have a $60,000 car. I said, so let's logically take a look at that. I said, what got us in that situation? Well, I was able to borrow the car at 74 months. And so I said, then we start there. I said, so now we need to start making different decisions. So that's where the rewiring of the foundation comes in. Mm -hmm. When I start to teach people, we need to get on the right side of the cash flow quadrant, right? Robert Kiyosaki. And we teach them that. We also need to teach people what debt is too. You know, there's different, uh, all great teachers as well. You got Dave Ramsey, who's, you know, all cash, no debt. You got Robert Kiyosaki, who's all debt, no cash. You got Grant Cardone, all real estate, no cash. And I'm like, you have to really ask yourself what works for you. For me, it's a mix. I have enough to pay my bills for six months. And then I use debt to build businesses to, uh, I use debt to get tax-free income to buy assets, but you can't start there with people. Cause if you say, well, use debt 
to get cash to buy assets. They're like, what are you talking about? So we stop for a moment and say, what is money? So once we teach them what money is, then we ask them, where is your money flowing? So that's where we start the conversation with people um, because that's where I was. I left I left banking. I had a, a CBA executive banking degree, and I didn't understand what money was. I was buried in debt. I had the huge home on a golf course. I had the 535 BMW, the big SUV, making a quarter of a million, barely making it. So how was I able to, how am I able to properly educate people when I didn't even know what money was? So I've spent the last since 2017 to 2024 really studying what money is and then the cycles that they take us through. That's why I say what you repeatedly do gets ingrained in your subconscious mind becomes your unconscious activity. So in order to change my unconscious activities, I had to change my subconscious. I had to change the deep rooted indoctrination from the schooling system. Like I think we're just talking about this. Like I'm taking my mm -hmm. son out of the schooling system and I'm, I teach my son about money. I teach my daughter about money. So yeah, it's just, it's almost like not, not in a condescending way, but when I I'm sitting there with a, a 45 year old adult, I'm like, I'm, we're going to talk, like, we're going to talk like you're just starting out learning about money. Mm -hmm. And they appreciate that because it's like, oh, that makes sense. So it's not that complex. It's not that complex. We just have to start to understand what money truly is, which is debt in America. You know, I was having a conversation with my mom, and I'm sure she's going to be listening to this. So uh, mm -hmm. uh, I'll, I'll repeat it. But she and I were talking. She, As she's gotten older, she feels some regret. Like she was a little bit tough on me by kicking me out when I was 17, almost 18 and she said, you know, maybe I made a mistake. And I was like, it's the best damn thing you could have done because I went out and became a man, number one. But number two, now that I think about what you're saying, I had no money. Mm -hmm. I had nothing. I had a little moped. I lived in in Ohio. I went. I lived near Kent State University, but I have no money. I have to live in a little uh, a room within a house that I rented for $120 a month. And I rode that moped one hour to a factory where I worked for $3.35 an hour. And I did that for a couple of years until I could finally get myself into university and then finally educate myself. But I've always lived deeply below my means, deeply. Mm -hmm. As my income rose, I didn't increase my spending. And so I've, I've stayed in the same apartment and I never bought a house here in Thailand. And I stayed in the same apartment uh, for 20 years. And wow. basically, uh, the cost of that apartment is absolutely tiny. And it just brings me so much comfort to live deeply yes. below my means. And I was just teaching a class at university about my book, How to Start Building Your Wealth, Investing in the Stock Market. And I was like, you know, the first thing you have to understand is that a job can be a wealth machine. If you're making $100,000 and you're spending $95,000, well, you're dead. But if you're making 100,000 and you're spending 40,000, that is $60,000 a year of wealth that you created and you put it in your bank as a starting point. And then later you look at the stock market and other investments of how do you, how do you grow it? But just yes. creating wealth can be done through salary. It just said, you've got to take a different mindset. And so I appreciate what you're, what you're teaching. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's that's one of the things too you brought brought up the bank is like what I explain to people when they understand what money is and that so when I when I tell uh, you know I'm 48 so if I'm sitting across another 48 years old or 48 year old and they're sitting there with 150 thousand in the bank, I say so imagine a world putting 150 thousand dollars in the bank and your money right now is sitting in someone else's bank account. They're like what? I'm like, your money is sitting in someone else's bank account. The banks actually, they make money in three ways, interest income, fee income, capital markets income at a base level, right? Mm. So they're taking the money, they're using third parties, they're making six to 12% and they're giving you negative 1%. And they're like, well, why can't I do that? I'm like, well, you can, you can. And so then it goes into like diversification, risk allocation, and, you know, th that's, you know, cryptocurrency. That's where mm. we built a, a large amount of wealth, but that's was one of our worst investments because we did not have an exit plan. And like, so everybody's, this is the thing that I tell people too, because there's so many boom and bust cycles, the auto boom, the dot-com boom, the crypto boom, the AI booms coming. And so everybody, they're in this vertical strategy and then they see these booms come and they're like, they're, you know, they're at the gym or at the barbershop and this new thing comes and then they take this big allocation of their cash and they put it into this one asset class and there's no game plan. And that's where I'm trying so hard to teach people. It's like, there is no get rich quick. There's getting wealthy for sure by understanding economic cycles and how money moves through the system. And that's the, one of the other things that we teach is how does money move through the system? And we made money currency, right? The bank dams mm -hmm. it up. 
we make it current. We make sure that when money hits our bank account, we make sure we have enough in the bank to pay the bills, support our family, things like that for a couple months. And then every bit of money that hits my account, it has to flow through the system. Like it has to, I, I love the book, uh, Richest Man in Babylon. Mm -hmm. A little bit of a harder read, but once I read that, I'm like, wow. Every time money hits my bank account, I create a brother or sister. I'm like, okay, where are you going? Like, what, what, how are we going to multiply this? What seeds are we going to plant? So, yeah, it's mm. pretty neat. Once people understand money and then you contextualize it and you say, okay, money is just an, uh, an exchange of energy. It's just an exchange of energy for value. I love that how you said that because a lot of people think mm. my, my greatest wealth has come from entrepreneurship yep. and, you know, scaling and things like that. But not everybody's being on, you know, here we are at two o'clock in the morning, right? It's like two, three o'clock. Entrepreneurship is not an easy journey. But as it, I was making quarter of a million as an executive and I was right. still broke. Yeah. I was broke. Yeah. And that's where I think one of the big lessons from all of this in my life and from talking with you is the idea, I, I call it your wealth engine. You've got right. to get that cranking because yes. you can't, you can't grow your way to wealth. You have to create wealth yes. and that wealth is either created through a, a job or it's created as an entrepreneur, but since most people are just not cut out to be entrepreneurs, then mm -hmm. it's best to just focus on creating that wealth through a job. Well, now it's time to share your worst investment ever. And you've already hinted at it a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, since no one goes into their worst investment thinking it will be, tell us a bit about the circumstances leading up to it and then tell us your story. Yeah. So I, you know, I left corporate America, super excited, you know, about entrepreneurship and um, I got the crap kicked out of me, to be honest with you. I ended up leaving. I had a 401k. You know, I, I I was an executive for quite a while. I had a very comfy, I had plenty of money in the bank account, 401k, and I leave to start this entrepreneurship journey. So my first thing was, is I didn't really understand the ins and out of entrepreneurship and scaling. So the first thing happened is I lost all my money. But then this great promise of cryptocurrency came into my life. You know, somebody came walking into one of my uh, facilities. We got shut down during the pandemic. And uh, they were like, hey, have you ever heard of this, you know, crypto? And, and in banking, we were indoctrinated at a deep level that crypto was a fraud, right? In 2017, Jamie Dimon had said, you know, it's used for money laundering. If you touch it, you're going to get fired, all this stuff. We we're in the banking system. And so I had this deep rooted indoctrination around those types of things that they were pet rocks and all this stuff. And so when I saw it, though, I was introduced to a, a coin called XRP, and I'm like, why aren't banks using this? Why why wouldn't banks use this liquidity, this this distributed ledger technology on demand? Well, then I started researching, and they are. A lot of them are using JPM coin. They have all these. So I, I go really deep into research. Well, then I saw the excitement of all the money being made in cryptocurrency, and it ended up being what has become one of my best investments became my worst investment ever because I go into this speculative asset with no game plan, just like everything else, putting my money into a 401k, I go into cryptocurrency and we started making so much money and there was tons of money coming in. There was yield, there's things called yield farming and there was leverage trading and all these things that we couldn't even keep up with all the different coins being pumped at us and stuff. And then we started to become influential in the space. You know, I was kind of taking people through my journey from going broke. I lost everything because pandemic shut me down. So I had this cryptocurrency portfolio and my worst investment ever was having cryptocurrency with no exit plan. So we actually saw ourselves go from millionaires <laughs> to thousandaires overnight from 2021 to 2022. Literally, I remember waking up and I had pulled some profits, but we did not have a proper exit plan. And all of a sudden I remember waking up and it seems like it was overnight. I wake up and I'm like, it was down 80 5%. Now, the problem with this is, and I and I take responsibility for this, we were hyping this up and we're super, and everybody's, we're all adults trying to figure this out. And we have this opportunity, a big boom, and we're pumping our money into this vertical, vertical. So we're pumping our money into, it's going to make us rich. And this influencer said this, and this influencer said this. And next thing you know, we're all sitting there holding the bag. We're like, wow. Wow. Mm -hmm. So what that did was, is it really made us take a deep breath and say, what is our intentions with this? Like, what are we trying to do? And so we started to focus on what our intentions are is financial freedom for our family, freedom of choice, freedom of time, and freedom to build the ecosystems that our families deserve. And we realized that we have to step back for it. We did pull some profits, which helped us tremendously. We were able to invest in companies, which, so we sat back and we said, how does this work? And so we started going deep into history. I love Ray Dalio's Changing World Order. And then we just started to see the waves and cycles, whether it's the Bitcoin halving, whether it's uh, uh, World War II, whether it's the dot-com boom, whether it's the 2006 to 2007 collapse. And I started to study waves of energy. And so 
our worst investment was crypto with no exit plan. And, and that's why I've been boldly stating this to people over and over again, because it's coming again. We're back. We're on the back end of 2024. It's going into its four year cycle. And there's so many people that have not unindoctrinated themselves and they think they're going to get rich quick and people are going to put their life savings in there. There was people mortgaging their houses. And then all of a sudden we saw them come collapsing down. So our worst investment actually became our best lesson, which made us wealthy. <laughs> mm. And um, how would you describe the lesson, like the core lesson that you learned from it? The core lesson, diversification, diversification, mm. diversification inside the, the asset class and outside the asset class. Great, great lessons. Um, uh, maybe I'll share a few things. I, I've actually been a, a CFO of a crypto exchange here in Thailand, where Thailand is a regulated market. The exchanges are heavily regulated by the SEC. And so um, my focus has ultimately been about um, finance and compliance as best that I could, you know, over the years. Uh, but yeah, I was just looking at the numbers, the crypto winter that we went through um, was brutal for everybody. Mm -hmm. And Bitcoin fell by 72% from what I yeah. remember from the end of 2021 till the end of 2022. So yeah. it definitely was a brutal time. Um, there's a couple of things that I take away from it, you know, uh, the first thing is that one of the lessons that I've learned in my life is that, uh, when you make massive gains, mm -hmm. take some profit. Yes. <laughs> and I, and so that's, you know, there's diversification is critical as you've said, mm -hmm. but there's also the idea of taking profit now yep. for portfolios that I, I have in Thailand for my clients, basically we kind of force a quarterly reconsideration yep. where we're rebalancing and taking some of the gains and putting them into things that have gone down a bit. And that helps us from getting overextended. The other part of diversification is just making sure you're not overly extended to any one asset class, particularly what I use is stocks, bonds, commodities, and gold. Beautiful. And, you know, being, over, you know, heavily weighted in gold or commodities is pretty, pretty extreme. When you think the core thing, what, what I really want is I want, I want to own stocks mm -hmm. because every company that I own in the portfolio has a CEO working his butt off yes. to prevent the company from, you know, seeing its margins go down or losing market mm -hmm. share. And it's got a management team. And if I own the S and P 500, I have 500 C CEOs busting their butts with mm -hmm. 10 people on their team. I got, you know, 5,000 people working for me every single day. And so that's that. nothing can beat business over the long term. So mm -hmm. just be careful when we diversify to don't go too heavy into, you know, and I think that's one of the things that I see people do is they get excited or their gains get so big that they're really, really heavily weighted. And that's the time to take some profit. Any, anything you would add to that? Yeah, so much to unpack there. I love what you said. So you know, the things that we teach, first of all, is if if you walked into a casino in Vegas and you put down $1,000 and you win $2,000, you should always pull your house money or pull your money and play on the house money. So we always tell people, pull your initial investment, especially in crypto, it goes up so quick. It's easy to pull your initial investment. So now you're on house money, right? Take your initial investment, maybe allocate it in another asset class. You said so many powerful things there. If you look at like diversification. So we, I read the book, Intelligent Investor. I think it was the one Warren Buffett, Warren Buffett read when he was 12 and he switched from investing in stocks. Yep. So stocks to investing in companies. And so, yep. So we, we adopted that within cryptocurrency. And so the way that I allocated and diversified within crypto is looking at cryptocurrency companies that I can study the CEO, mm -hmm. the CFO. I look at the board of directors. Does it have a real world solve, right? Does this actually have a real world solve? And is it going to be a regulated, regulator survivors, but we call American regulation. Is it going to survive American regulation? So when we do that, and then one thing that I've, I've developed is uh, we actually developed an app called Merlin, the smartest way to track your crypto, which is an exit strategy. So we, we got hurt so bad in the markets that we've developed. We do what's called a ladder out because what we know two things. Number one is the hype train kicks off and the exchanges shut down because they're getting liquidated, right? All of a sudden there's technical issues and, you know, you're at the top of a, of a chart and, and all of a sudden 
you're a millionaire and you can't pull profits, right? Mm -hmm. They're, oh, technical issues. We're overloaded. The server's overloaded. So what we do is we set exit targets based on the all-time high, the previous all-time high, and then we exit on the way up. We ladder out. Now, for me, when I exit the markets, I look across. I'm pretty diversified in business as the CEO of multiple companies. So, and a lot of, and to be transparent, a lot of my wealth comes from business. And mm -hmm. like you said, because I get to control the levers. I get to pull the levers. What I use is tier one capital. So I love to invest in cash value insurance. So I use insurance. I'm diversified across business. A little bit of precious metals. I love what you said about precious. They can be manipulated by the banks as well. <laughs> but so precious metals. Uh, and then we focus on um, uh, cryptocurrency. And that's one of the biggest things. But for me, it's a ladder strategy. Uh, I exit on the way up and I just do the opposite of the 99%. I buy when everybody's freaking out, panicking. I buy when there's blood in the streets, Warren Buffett. And I sell when everybody's celebrating. But my favorite story of Robert Kiyosaki, and I'm going to paraphrase this, but uh, he says when he's sitting in the grocery store and everybody's talking about getting rich in real estate, he's starting to sell some real estate. So when I'm sitting in the barber shop getting my beard done or I'm in the steam room at the gym and I start hearing people talking about get rich in crypto, when the conversations pick up, I'm like, it's time to start exiting. And we start pulling profits. And so, you know, we just pull and we always look at um, the opportunity cost of our money, right? Right. So if we mm -hmm. pull, if you pull a hundred thousand dollars, you now have a hundred thousand dollars. I call it Fugazi, fake money, fiat money. It's like, where can I move this fake money to something tangible that I can, and I, I like to leverage against my assets uh, tax-free. And so that's something that, that we help people uh, understand as well. It's like, how, how can you get into assets that you can leverage tax-free? Cause that's something as well. Uh, when people pull crypto, <laughs> They don't, they don't understand the tax implications as well. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So I, I love what you're saying. We always exit on the way up now. We're not married to crypto. It's it, extremely, I want to tell people a cautionary tale in America. It's, it's so speculative still. Mm -hmm. The great yeah. thing about that is you can make a lot of money <laughs> yep. if you uh, have a game plan. Exactly. So let's go back in time to when you got into your worst investment ever. Obviously, mm -hmm. you know, you, you thought you were doing the right thing. And but you were pushing risks and pushing other things probably farther than you should have. Uh, mm -hmm. And so let let me ask you this question. Let's think of a young person right now today who's approaching a similar situation based on what you learned from the story you've just told us, as well as what you've continued to learn. What's one action that you'd recommend that person take to avoid suffering the same fate? Yeah, one action I would take is always take 24 hours to make the decision. That's what I would do is because when somebody, what I realized is when somebody's coming to you very excited about something, right? That's the thing. It was like, have you heard of this? <laughs> it's like, stop for a moment, listen, use discernment, and also seek wise counsel. So take mm. 24 hours and then make sure that the person coming to you is wise counsel, right? You know, they may be excited about somebody that told them something, but often I found, you know, I'm mentoring with uh wise counsel now and wise counsel doesn't come to me and call me at two o'clock in the after jv i got the hottest deal right now we set up a zoom call we talk about the 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 uh the investment we mm -hmm. look at the, the we look at risk weighting we look at all these different things and we make it a, a very sound decision it could take a couple weeks and if the if the if the if the investment isn't there in a couple of weeks, then it wasn't the right investment yeah. so if i was talking to my old self i'd say take a deep breath jv wait 24 hours and ask yourself is the person presenting this to you wise counsel? Mm -hmm. Great, great point. Uh, we've talked about some different resources from Ray Dalio to Benjamin Graham's Intelligent Investor mm -hmm. to Robert Kiyosaki. Um, I always say that the book uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, unfortunately, is one of the worst books that's been published. And people mm -hmm. can't believe this because what I mean by this is that um, – the rich dad is a business man. Mm. The poor dad is a salary man. Yes. My dad was a salary man and you know, he managed to, to become mm. somewhat rich, but the problem is only a fraction of 1% of people in this world are suitable to be entrepreneurs. Mm. And so that book is basically saying to everybody that's reading it, be a rich dad be an entrepreneur, mm. which is very mm. bad advice for the 99.5% of people who get it. Mm -hmm. But for that 0.5%, it's going to really work out. But for the other ones, it's going to be hard. Now, 
I have to admit that there's a lot of great lessons in there. And he's also yeah. followed up with some great books like Cash Flow Quadrant and all that. But I just yes. want people, it, when I thought about that more deeply, I really realized that we have to help people to get rich through their salary also. I love that. You know, it's I, I've never heard that perspective and I've never mm. heard that. And I appreciate that because I have to back you on that. So mm. we're so when I went to go start my businesses, you know, I'm leaving a quarter of a million dollar job safety net to go start businesses. And I remember, you know, I talked to somebody close to me and the first thing they said was, do you know that 85 percent of small businesses fail? Well, my mindset is flip flopped. I said, well, 15 percent succeed and one percent become seven figure ecosystems. And they're like, oh, well, we'll see what happens. Well, I failed for a couple of years and now we have three seven figure ecosystems. But you're right. Like only I think it's one percent become over small, uh, small businesses become uh, million dollar mm -hmm. ecosystems. Right. Yeah. And so. What I got, I love what you just said, because we've been experiencing that. We've had 8,000 people go through our academy and, and people try to do what we're doing. And so what we tell people is like, don't try to do what we do. Learn what works for you, yep. right? So like you said, if you're in a job, the first thing you can do is the way you can create money immediately is look at your budget. Yep. Look at get your budget. That, so get you, that wealth engine cranking. Yes. Dude, it's like an expenses. ATM machine. Mm -hmm, mm hmm. Yeah. So I'm like, Hey, decrease expenses right there. There you go. You get a pay raise. Number two is go to your boss and ask for a raise <laughs> two ways. There's two ways right there. And then all of a sudden, but now when you get that money, we don't buy a nicer car. Mm -hmm. We don't get a bigger house. We take that money and put it to work, which can get you on the right side of the cash flow quadrant where money's making money for you. And that that's a lot of the Warren Buffett is my favorite. Yeah. Like he's my he's favorite. Amazing. Like he's, yeah, he's uh, when I, he says, you know, you'll never be wealthy till you make money while you sleep. And that feeling, it, that's what the place I want to get to people. Because when I started to make money while I slept, whether it's entrepreneurship, investments, it gives you peace of mind. Yeah. When you wake up in the morning and you, you've you made more money than you made in a month prior in your job, but people can do that. I love what you're teaching because mm -hmm. I have to take take a little bit back on that and, and take some wise counsel from that because, mm -hmm. you know, I'm the flywheel's moving for me. You know, I, yeah. I made all my losses. I lost mm -hmm. my money twice through the process, but now the flywheel's going. So I have to step back for a moment and say to myself, like, yeah, you're in the flywheel because you spent seven years, you know, hundreds of thousands of posts and all this stuff and all my 401k to, to build this and stuff. And uh, I thank you for that because I'm taking that lesson because often on social media specifically, everybody's preaching this laptop lifestyle, passive income, all this. It's like, uh, it's all active, man. Yep. Yep. <laughs> it's all active, you know. Well, the other the other thing that most people don't realize, if they look at the hockey stick chart of compound interest or yes. compounding, what they don't re realize, and so when they talk about people say, "I want passive income," what does that mean? Well, to to the average person, it means that I sit back and collect cash flow mm -hmm. from my investments. Yep. Now, in theory, that's where we all want to be. However, yep. you have to remember that. The hockey stick is an exponential rise in our wealth in later years. Yep. And it, that hockey stick only comes from interest on interest. Yes. Which basically oh, means you can never take anything out of your investments. Yes. I love that. That's, that's one of my strategies. Yes. So like, that's why I use insurance for me. Mm. So, you know, we use next universal life. We I'm a licensed insurance agent. So we, I use cash value insurance plans and it's, it's like a hog. It's not sexy yeah. in the beginning. If you touch it in the beginning, it's not going to work. Yeah. It's uh, after seven years, it starts, you know, what is it? The eighth wonder of the world is compound interest. Mm. And it's like, if you watch that and that's why I'm also trying to help people too. Like, you know, you go to school, get a job, you go on the 401k. To me, it's an opposite of a hockey stick, right? Your mm. earning is in the beginning. And then all of a sudden you get taxed on the back end. It starts to fall off when you're supposed to retire. Mm. And so I think it's important what you're teaching too, is like to take a little bit of sovereignty of your wealth, you know, yeah. not just, you know, I don't know how you feel about walking into an HR director and be like, Hey, yeah, put some of this money in my four in the 401k. I mean, the creator of the 401k is quoted saying I made a product that made wall street wealthier. You know, it's like, uh. <laughs> yeah. I think it's important for people to take sovereignty of their wealth or at least understand your, where your hard earned money is going. Yeah, I think you've got to be careful of anything the government's send, selling you. And ultimately, 401k, here we just had a big, what I, I call it an ESG fund scam because the government pushed wow. all the asset management companies to go out and push an ESG fund and, you know, get a lot of people into it. And of course, Anybody that knows anything about finance knows that an ESG fund is going to underperform mm -hmm. a similar fund, similar type, whether it's passive or active over the long term, for 
a couple of reasons. The first reason is that you're reducing the universe that you're selecting from because you're giving ESG scores to 500 companies and you're saying, we're not, we're not going to invest in 50 of those or 100 of those. Anytime you remove any stocks from your universe, you're reducing your opportunities for gain. Mm. And, and then there's other reasons we know that anything that's ESG is going to be more expensive to do within the company or else the company would already be doing it. Good and point. so it's yeah. naturally going to drive down returns. And so what happened was that fund managers pushed the government's propaganda on ESG. And I told my fund manager friends, be very careful because you could be caught out for misrepresenting the returns of this product. And wow. it doesn't, don't bring any comfort to yourself that the government was supporting it because when it comes down and they have your records of your emails and of your calls and the government's mm -hmm. changed and they're onto something else, they ain't going to come back and save you. So be careful yeah. about, about that's something, you know, specifically about Thailand. So let yeah, me ask wow. you last question. What is your number one goal for the next 12 months? Oh, great. question! Number one goal is to, um, to stay non-emotional about what's happening in America. America is going through a really, <laughs> really rough time right now to stay non-emotional and to stay focused on my fundamentals, uh, to be as, uh, keen as possible on, on, not getting caught. I call it the greed gene. We you know cryptocurrency is about to go through the uh, the Bitcoin having, and then interest rates are going to drop in America, which I believe is going to co cause hyperinflation in our assets. And my main goal is to not make the same mistake I made in 2021 to 2022. We're set up, you know, we've been accumulating since, you know, the, it's been very low. We've been accumulating, mm -hmm. accumulating. This potentially could be life-changing for us and our warriors. So the main goal is to stay non-emotional about everything that's happening, to stay focused on, on for me, God, following the life of Jesus, uh, staying focused on foundations, family, staying non-emotional and understanding that this is the greatest opportunity in human history. I really believe that in these volatile times like this, it's one of the greatest times for people to build wealth. Um, it just is part of a cycle. And so for me, stay non-emotional, stay focused on my foundation of God and family and, and, and have fun too. enjoy myself. You know, it's like the stuff that's happening within America. It's, it's happening all around me, but I can I can focus on my own actions, my own behaviors, my own foundation. And so, yeah, so for me, it's stay non-emotional. I always say keep the greed gene out of it because crypto is going to go parabolic straight up. And mm. we learned our lesson last time. We, we want to make our worst investment our best investment ever. <laughs> well, in my last strategy report that I wrote for my clients, my prediction was either end of this year, last year, or by the end of first quarter, mm. U.S. interest rates at zero. Really? At the at the end of this quarter, you said? Yeah. Now really? my my argument is simple that, you know, uh they've propped up the economy through the spending that's been done by borrowing. We've had an yeah. inverted yield curve now for more than a year. Yes. Um employment is at its peak, which tends to be a signal that it's about to uh that we're hitting a peak for the economy and for the market. Mm -hmm. And the Fed has only one tool, and they've shown over the years that they're just perfectly happy to reduce interest rates to zero. Mm -hmm. And it's an election year. And yes. there's one yeah. there's one man that could potentially win this election, but I suspect mm -hmm. it's just too painful to allow him to win. And mm -hmm. so all, you know, if as we saw before the midterm elections, the release of the Strategic Petroleum Reserve and man managed to really push down oil prices and therefore prices at the pump and prices in general. And I think that that really tipped the scales for the election uh, that yeah, was potentially yeah. going another way for the Biden administration. And I'm just mm -hmm. watching for what's going to come. But I think yeah. bringing interest rates back down to zero is something that I think is quite possible. And if that happens, then the equity markets fly. So I still, oh, I think you, you yeah. got to be careful not to, you know, when you look at the stock market in America, it's yeah. very expensive. I got to be careful not to mm -hmm. move too much money out of that and keep exposure. I'm not overexposed. I'm exposed to some other asset classes, but mm -hmm. generally that's my, um, my, my, my prediction. And the, the last thing about the U S you know, it's, it's really, I'm, I'm really sad to see it go. It was mm -hmm. a great experiment. I put up a post on my LinkedIn about a year ago and I asked people how many years will it be before the first amendment is changed in the U S wow. mm. is amended. And, wow. you know, there was a, a good number that said never, but there was also a good number said five years. Holy and I think God. the, the idea when, when I, you know, I, if I was in America and I put up billboard, it would be 
Hate is legal. Mm. We need wow. to understand that if somebody mm. hates another person, as long as they don't do violence or as long as they don't do a physical attack, somebody can sit in their home or live their life hating other people. That is legal only in America, not in mm. Europe, not in other countries. But the benefit of this is that it helps us understand that we stop trying to control people's speech and people's thought. But unfortunately, yeah. America wants to make, you know, they want to make a lot of different speech illegal. And I would say probably five years to 10 years from now, we're going to see, you know, some pretty, pretty scary things. And for the rest of the world out there, yeah. it it's it's losing, you know, that that loses hope for the rest of the world because there's no country in the world that is mm -hmm. going to be able to provide as much rights for individuals as the U.S. So well, when the U.S. Yeah. goes down, then there's no hope mm -hmm. for that. So I've been I've been talking about that since 2020 on my channel, and I agree with you with interest rates. And did you see the um, Jerome Powell interview that he just did on 60 Minutes? It's pretty bone chilling. At the at the back end of it, I, I encourage all Americans to watch it. Jerome Powell literally caught the ball and he's like, he, and you can almost see his soul. he like his, his soul is breaking. He's like, he says at the end of the interview, I'll just leave it at this. He mm -hmm. says, America is on a unsustainable path. And I've been telling people guys when they, the only option they have is to lower interest rates. That's it. That's going to cause hyperinflation or reset the system. There's, there's no, there's no other way out of this. They, there's mm -hmm. so much debt and it's all debt. There's the, all they have to do is they just have to monetize debt and move it around the system. The stock market's overvalued. Everything is just, mm -hmm. I call it Fugazi. Everything is just fake money. It's all this yep. fake money. And, and what, what I felt him say, and he said this a couple of times throughout the last couple of years, he said, I'm worried about the middle class getting wiped out, leveraged towards technology. What he was trying to say to the middle class is get your shit together. <laughs> like you yeah. need to start creating a budget. You need to start getting your family in line. You need to start reducing your expenses because America is about to go through one of the hardest times economically that we've ever been through. We're so over leveraged, all the people and the country. And um, yeah, it's going to be a really bumpy ride. But also yeah. too, again, I tell people it's the greatest opportunity to build wealth. Protect yourself. Uh, mm -hmm. That's a great, great lesson. You know, and I, I also warn people that AI is going to make what outsourcing to China did to the working class mm. seem like yep. nothing. When AI truly hits the middle class, it is going to move a lot of people from middle class to lower class in America, and it will happen very fast. Well, listeners, there you have it. Another story of loss to keep you winning. Remember, I'm on a mission to help 1 million people reduce risk in their lives. As we conclude, Coach JV... I want to thank you again for joining our mission. And on behalf of A. Stotts Academy, I hereby award you alumni status for turning your worst investment ever into your best teaching moment done all at 2, 3 a.m. in the morning. Do you have a parting words, any parting words for our audience? Absolutely. Remember what you believe in your heart, you think in your mind will eventually become your words and become your reality. If you can see it in your mind, eventually you can hold it right here in your hands. What you repeatedly do gets ingrained in your subconscious mind. What gets ingrained in your subconscious mind becomes your unconscious activities. Amen. And that's a wrap on another great story to help us create, grow, and protect our well fellow risk takers. Let's celebrate that today we added one more person to our mission to help 1 million people reduce risk in their lives. This is your worst podcast host, Andrew Stott, saying, I'll see you on the upside.